Mr. Hamm. May it please the Court. It is my pleasure today to say some words uh, from the bar about Lord Walker on his last sitting day before the statutory shutters come down on his judicial career. Um, the Court is, is, is full, and the fact that so many busy people have come down to Westminster, uh, and the fact that several people um, wanted to make this speech probably show more eloquently than anyth anything I can say the high regard in which uh, Lord Walker is held by practitioners and his fellow judges. Uh, I've been sitting here trying to think what the collective noun for masters of the roles must be. Um, <laughs> it, it's, it's something I've, I've, I've never encountered before. Now, everybody here today knows the great contribution that Lord Walker has made to the law in his judicial capacity. Uh, particularly in the House of Lords in this court, uh, where he sal sat for well over half his judicial career. Uh, I want to say something about uh, the first half of his uh, life in the law as a practitioner. Uh, I first became aware of Lord Walker when I was a pupil, and I have, despite the passage of time, a, a very clear recollection of the occasion. Uh, I was in court with my pupil master, uh, listening to the end of the case before ours, and Lord Walker was making a reply on an old-fashioned construction summons. Now, the judge in question, whom I won't name, had a disconcerting habit of muttering to himself <laughs> during <laughs> counsel submissions. <laughs> One couldn't hear what he said, but the general impression was it wasn't necessarily complimentary. <laughs> Not so when that promising junior, Mr. Walker, was addressing him. Rapt attention, and rightly so, uh, because of the clarity, precision, and quiet persuasiveness of the submissions. Well, it, it stuck in my mind uh, at the time, and I still remember it. In the years that followed, uh, I was practiced in the same fields as Lord Walker, and I was therefore lucky enough to have quite a lot to do with him. Uh, and I. Uh, saw his advice, his drafting, and his advocacy, which continued to share the qualities I'd noted on that first occasion. Uh, Lord Walker's uh, drafting is distinctive not only for its clarity and precision, but for the fact that he eschewed the use of uppercase um, initials for defined terms. You can look at a, at, at a deed and say, ah, Walker. <laughs> Now, uh, amongst those here today are not only um, judges and barristers, but also some solicitors who uh, used to instruct Lord Walker. And I was reminded of something that one of them said to me some years ago when we were sitting in uh, the house of a uh, wealthy set law where the, um, uh, one wall had two Matisse, another of Van Dongen, and so on. And uh, the solicitor said to me that he'd been talking to Lord Walker about uh, the differences between private client solicitors and barristers, and that Lord Walker had said to him that he really remiss regretted that he'd missed the domiciliary visits. <laughs> <laughs> now, it is, if anything, an understatement to say that Lord Walker was preeminent in the fields where he practiced. Um, in a period of rapid change in the tax treatment of subtle property, he was always at the forefront of working out um, how to respond to the changes visited on us by Parliament. And then, um, comparatively early on, he took to pensions. And uh, about this, he, he said at a conference in Cambridge in 1966, 1996 that pension schemes resemble cricket or horse raiding, racing or poker. Either you're fascinated by them or you find them stupefyingly boring. <laughs> Uh, pensions law has, has moved on a great deal, but I'd like to pay tribute to the part that Lord Walker, as a practitioner, played in working out how trust law um, impacted on uh, this new field of pensions law. Uh, that's uh, all I wanted to say, and I think I've exceeded my time limit. Um, could I, on behalf of us all, thank Lord Walker for, for his contributions over, over the years? Um, I hope it's not inappropriate in, in advance to wish him a happy birthday on Sunday and very many happy returns. Mr. Nuti. My lords, my lady, 
It's an unusual experience to be invited to address valedictory remarks to a judge while he's in the middle of hearing your case. <laughs> it runs the obvious risk of their being taken as merely sycophantic. Uh, I do remember the president once saying to me, Mr. Nugie Flaffery will get you nowhere, although he then added, well, it might. <laughs> But it's not in a spirit of sycophancy, but with genuine admiration, that I'm honoured and pleased to add my own personal tribute to Lord Walker. While at the bar, he epitomised that Victorian quality of luminescence. He was a, indeed the, luminary of the Chancery Bar. I have recently had the experience of acting for some Cayman trustees who had the good sense over 20 years ago to instruct Mr Robert Walker QC, and I read a fair number of his opinions. So I have a good idea of his style of opinion writing, steeped in learning, but short, precise, readily understandable, wise, and above all, commanding complete confidence in the accuracy of their conclusions. Needless to say, the trustees soon had to look elsewhere, and over the years instructed many well-known names, but none with quite the same felicity of being at the same time scholarly, reliable, and humane. I was led once by Mr Robert Walker QC in a case concerning the investment policy of the church commissioners, a case in which he memorably characterised the biblical injunction to take no thought for the morrow as Christian fecklessness. <laughs> <laughs> An attitude that, however theologically impeccable, was not perhaps ideal for those charged with stewardship of the church's finances. <laughs> it was a very instructive but rather humbling Experience. I have seldom, as a junior, felt so superfluous. His command of the facts and the law was so comprehensive that although he was always kind and generous in his thanks for my efforts, I did not feel that he needed or really derived much assistance from them. In due course, I appeared before both Mr Justice Robert Walker and later Lord Walker in a variety of cases dealing with pension funds, the School Sites Act, Chartbrook and Persimmon Homes, Unsurprisingly, he brought the same qualities to the branch as he displayed at the bar. In each field, he could bind complete mastery of the facts with a deeply erudite understanding of the law, even in its more obscure corners, all expressed with unfailing courtesy. At the outset of this appeal two days ago, the President said, I wonder if there is anybody who knows all about this jurisdiction. <laughs> <laughs> that is, the equitable supervisory jurisdiction over trusts. The answer, of course, is yes, and is sitting right next to him. <laughs> it has been an honour and a real pleasure to have known, worked with and appeared before Lord Walker. We at the Chancery Bar will be sorry to see him go. And speaking personally, I wish him all the best in his retirement or in whatever he chooses to do next. Well, I think for the first time during this case, I can say that I entirely agree with that. <laughs> every point they've made. Um, as usual, they've exceeded their time limit, so I've got to fit in at the end. Um, the first occasion that I appeared before um, Mr Justice uh, Walker was shortly after he'd been appointed to the bench. Um, I had not come across um, Robert Walker QC in practice. I had an application for leave to serve out of the jurisdiction. It involved some complicated company law points, and it was replete with difficulties uh, under the Brussels Convention. I had told a colleague that who I was appearing in front of and what the case was about, and my colleague says, said, um, well, he'll know nothing about that at all. <laughs> he, all he knows about is trusts and tax. Um, needless to say, uh, from the moment that we started in court, um, my lord had read everything, was completely on top of it, on top of all the law. Um, he politely and courteously showed me where I'd gone wrong and how to get the application through. And I was eternally grateful for that. And I think one of the qualities that those of us who have practiced as we're outside the field of trusts and tax is how Lord Walker was on top of absolutely everything. We didn't have him for very long at first instance, which was a great pity, but nevertheless, um, it, it was well deserved that he quickly rose to the uh, House of Lords. And therefore, I, um, I have no doubt that not just in the trusts and tax field, but in a much wider area, many of my Lord's judgments will be cited for long to come. And therefore, if I could also just concur with what everybody said, and I do wish Lord Walker a happy and healthy retirement. Herbert. 
My lords, my lady, um, there are some coincidences in my uh, participating in a valedictory to my lord, Lord Walker, um, spatchcocked in, so to speak, to an appeal about the rule in Hastings Bass. I acted as junior to Mr. Robert Walker QC in a case which uh, some of your lordships will now be aware of, namely Metoy, uh, which, in which uh, a version of the rule in Hastings Bass was promulgated by the late Mr. Justice Warner. Uh, and my learned friend, Mr. Nugi's father, was also involved as counsel in the, in the same case. I recall that one of my tasks um, in the case was to assist my leader to research a passage from Virgil's Aeneid. <laughs> <laughs> that sort of thing doesn't happen much these days. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> be, that, uh, be that as it may, it was, I think, on the 3rd of October 1994 that I had a task of welcoming Mr. Justice Walker, as he then was on the first time that he sat as an appointed judge in the Chancery Division. And then I had the appalling temerity to suggest that after a career at the bar, which, as we all know, is full of uncertainties, uh, he had at last embarked on a proper job. <laughs> it was regarded as a joke at the time, by, <laughs> by some anyway. Um, but now, and with the benefit of hindsight, absolutely everybody can see just what a proper job he has made of it. He has contributed enormously to the development of the law, not only in his original fields of trusts, tax, and chancery, but across the board. Not only that, it has been, uh, his, this new career has been practiced to the highest standards, to, at eventually the highest level, and uh, invariably with good nature. I cannot remember ever hearing the slightest criticism of the way Lord Walker has conducted a case. Uh, we at the bar do not always win our cases, obviously, but win, lose, or draw, we and our clients have always felt that we have been heard courteously, considerately, and with respect. And that is a respect which is emphatically reciprocated. Uh, standing here, I have a number of constituents I'm speaking on behalf of. First of all, um, I express appreciation and thanks from the Chancery Bar Association, uh, the, pre the chairman, uh, is abroad at the moment, otherwise he would have been standing here in person. Um, my, lord, my lord, you have been amazingly and exceptionally generous with your time in giving talks, lectures, and chairing seminars for the association. Uh, for that, the association is extremely grateful. On a slightly more personal level, I have had the joy of being in chambers with Lord Walker for uh, almost 20 years in various different locations, first of all as his pupil, uh, then as a junior tenant and later as an ordinary tenant, um, and uh, uh, finally at Five Stone Buildings, and uh, your Lordship will see that there are many representatives of uh, those chambers here today, and on their behalf I uh, express their affection and goodwill on this occasion. I also want to briefly mention the law reporters. I don't in any sense have an um, authority to speak on their behalf, but uh, some will know <laughs> that uh, I do have a connection with uh, <laughs> uh, one of the reporters in this very court. And from that, I know that Lord Walker's dealings with the reporters ha uh, have been exemplary, uh, his, his usual... Um, uh, his usual uh, beneficence and uh, benign uh, treatment, uh, always with respect and consideration. So on behalf of uh, all of those constituents, um, I appreciate their, uh, I express their appreciation, their thanks, their, and their good wishes uh, for a long and happy retirement from a truly exceptional career in the law. Mr. Hamm, Mr. Nugi, Mr. Jones, Mr. Herbert, 
Uh, I know from my own experience, Mr. Justice Robert Walker was an outstanding judge. I first appeared in front of him in early 1995 in a complex case involving expert building issues, arbitration law, and lease interpretation. Confident that we were very much on home territory and before a judge who had no knowledge of such matters and relatively little trial experience, my opponent and I, rather like Mr. Jones in his case, thought that the hearing uh, would involve a lot of learning and teaching. We were right, <laughs> except it quickly became clear that, ju that the judge had been so diligent and was so intelligent that it was us learning from him, both on the substantive law uh, and on how to conduct trials. And as Mr. Herbert has said, uh, Robert Walker is a wonderful educator. Throughout his judicial career, he has been a dedicated, inspiring and brilliant advocacy trainer and speech maker, a quality he brought to his very successful year as treasurer of Lincoln's Inn. His judicial career involved a meteoric rise, which was as, 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 as unusual as it was deserved. Lord Walker, I should tell you, is as impressive to sit with as he was to appear before. During a hearing, uh, it not infrequently happens at around 3.30 in the afternoon, a fellow justice asks whether there was evidence at the trial on a particular issue. All but one of his or her colleagues looks blank. <laughs> Counsel and solicitors flounder around, and it's clear that nobody has the slightest idea. Then, all the more startling, because Robert has been silent all day, <laughs> a still small voice of calm from the bench says, bundle B28, <laughs> tab 19, page 623. Most people, indeed most judges, who are, are so astonishingly assiduous at familiarizing themselves with all the trees, fail to see the wood, but not Robert. Uh, he manages to encompass both the wood and the trees with his steady, focused, even bifocal gaze. He also has an enviably open mind while maintaining a principled approach. And he similarly combines intellectual rigor, indeed, as Mr. Nugia said, scholarliness, with a keen moral sense. The very best judges identify the right result and then arrive at it uh, without compromising legal principle. That is what Robert so regularly achieves in his well-written, authoritative, uh, and thought-provoking judgments, often dealing with very difficult issues. As he said in one of his famous speeches, it is not open to judges faced with a difficult question to say pass. As a barrister and a judge, Robert never said pass. And as, as Mr. Ham said, the qualities of, he demonstrated the qualities of, of, of the very finest of equity lawyers, which is what he is. And as a colleague, he's always combined intellectual ability uh, and confidence with, with personal modesty and diffidence. Like members of the bar who had the good fortune to be trained by him, to be led by him, or to appear in front of him, his fellow justices will remember him with much affection and will greatly miss him. We will do our best to live up to the very high standards uh, which he has set. His valuable and impressive contributions to the law will endure. And meanwhile, we, his colleagues, wish Robert and Suzanne a very long, very enjoyable, and very well-deserved retirement. My lords and my lady, Mr. Ham, Mr. Nugy, Mr. Jones, Mr. Herbert, Thank you very much for your very kind and generous, far too generous observations. At this interesting moment in my life, I feel, as anyone would, I think, a mixture of emotions. But those I feel most strongly are relief and gratitude. I feel great relief that I am managing to complete the last lap, and I feel gratitude to a huge number of people, my family, some of whom I hope may be watching on television, friends at the bar and at the other side of the profession, and latterly my colleagues in the Supreme Court and the wonderful staff of the Supreme Court for all the 
assistance and support and encouragement that they've given me over 53 years plus since I was called to the bar in 1960. I feel huge gratitude as well for having got where I have got. Some surprise as well, I, I have to say. I think for those of us who have been lucky in the ladder of judicial promotion, it is important to remind ourselves that except for a f small number of judicial superstars, they know who they are and we know who they are, uh, except for that small number of superstars, there is a huge amount of fortune or luck, or to use a, a favorite word of my lord in the chair, of happenstance <laughs> in who gets promotion and who doesn't. And I count myself enormously fortunate to have spent 10 years sitting in the top appeal court of the United Kingdom. If I have any regrets, and really I have no possible room for any regrets, but this is something that Mr. Jones mentioned, it is that I spent only three years as a first instance judge in the Thomas More Tower, where the chancery, uh, <laughs> chancery judges were then situated. Running your own court, listening to live evidence, and having to deal with all the unexpected emergencies and problems that emerge in the course of a trial is the heart of being a judge. And compared with that, appellate work is, dare I say, a little bit arid and detached. It was, I think, an Australian judge who, speaking of appellate tribunals, said that when the battle of the first instance trial is being joined in the plain. The appeal judges sit up in the hills. And at the end of the day, when the noise and dust is settling, they come down from the hills onto the battlefield and shoot the wounded. <laughs> My Lord President, thank you very much for organising this valedictory and thank you all very much indeed for coming. The court is adjourned.